Welcome to our Q&A with author Ian Ballantyne. Um, he was in episode 150, which has proved to be a very popular episode about the Cold War Royal Navy submarine missions. And uh, tonight is your opportunity to uh, ask him some questions and uh, hopefully some questions that I haven't already asked him. So if you want to ask questions, just use the live chat, which should be to the right of your screen and uh, just pop the question in there. And uh, I will uh, ask that to Ian and uh, we will see what answers we get. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Ian, uh, this is uh, one of his books. He's actually written two, well, at least two submarine books. Hunter Killers was the one that we spoke about in the episode. And there's also this one, The uh, Deadly Trade, which um, also covers Cold War. I think there's a uh, hundred odd pages in there of Cold War, but I'll let Ian do a quick intro. So Ian, go ahead. Hello. Um, those two books came out in the past few years, and the idea was that the first one would be about uh, the Cold War, and that was uh, seen through the eyes and experiences of a select band of brothers, if you like, of British submariners. And the deadly trade is a kind of all-encompassing uh, story of submarines from year dot, and it goes back centuries and right up to today. So I've had quite a few years submerged in uh, submarine warfare and development. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so it's been very, very interesting, and I've uh, been able to delve into some very interesting stories. Yeah, no, uh, fascinating stories. And, and Ian also introduced me to one of the characters from hunter killers as well who i have managed to uh interview and that that episode is uh is coming up soon so uh really uh in, enjoyed that um but ian i mean i think one of the things that i found really interesting was the the sort of section we talked about right at the end of the episode when you actually managed to get into Murmansk and you know see the submarine base there I mean that that must have been just unbelievable yeah yeah I mean it was a very interesting time in um as the Cold War ended uh, the Prime Minister John Major and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev who's the leader of the Soviet Union thought they would uh, show that things had changed it was post the Berlin Wall coming down and that things were thawed so they arranged this visit by a frigate called HMS London and a Royal Fleet Auxiliary tanker to reenact the um, one of the convoys to Russia in World War II. And so we went up around the top of Norway, and I was lucky enough to be among the journalists on, on board. And uh, then the uh, just before we left, in fact, the, the hardliners coup happened. So everything was up in the air. And after a bit of discussion, they decided they would deploy the ship uh, from the frigate from Rosyth. So I went up there. Uh, from our home base, which is in Plymouth, went up to Rosyth, um, and uh, we set sail. So all the way up around the top of Norway, it was a bit uncertain what would be happening and whether or not the Cold War would be back on again. And uh, as we got into the Barents Sea, there were aircraft flying over, and then there was a, a sovereign many destroyer coming up to shadow HMS London. And then out of the mist came this uh, frigate called the Gromke, and uh, it was unclear what, what was going to happen here. And of course, you have to understand this was the meeting of Cold War foes who hadn't exactly been best pals during World War II either, despite the convoys. And so there was a, a conversation on the bridge of the frigate about what should we do? And then they decided that uh, they would get the uh, sailors up on the upper deck of HMS London and cheer. And then the Russians came by in their frigate and they were cheering as well. So that was the end of the Cold War. It's quite extraordinary, actually. It must have been quite a moving moment, as you say. I mean, you know, they, they were, you know, a, d a dangerous time of the Cold War was was the sort of early eighties, and you know, both of these sides would have been, you know, prepared to prepared to fight each other. But to then meet as almost friends must have been a a powerful moment. Yeah, I mean, this was obviously nineteen ninety one, just after London had actually been um, flagship of a Royal Navy task group in the Northern Arabian Gulf to evict the Iraqis out of uh, Kuwait. So she just completed that mission, which was uh, 
quite uh, exciting for her crew. And so I suppose she was rewarded with this trip and um, things were still fairly, I suppose, not tense, but there was still, the old habits were still happening in the, as we went up around the north in this uncertain period, this was August 1991, with the hardliners uh, potentially returning the Soviet Union to the Cold War era, there were, it is said, there were, there were Russian submarines out there trading London and also uh, likely to be British submarines as well. So the, the watching was still going on. And you mentioned that we went down through the, um, the Murmansk Inlet uh, and as the, the ship went down through there, there was a Helix helicopter flying around over, overhead and they were taking photographs of HMS London to see her sensors and all the, the high-tech kit that was on board. And uh, I stood next to a, a Royal Navy photographer who was using a landscape camera to chronicle every single piece of the shoreline there with all the discarded ships and also the in-service ships all arrayed at the various places down, down the inlet. So it was extraordinary to go into the lair of the bear. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, now, people who have joined, you can ask your questions through the live chat, which is to the right of your screen. I see that Carsten Schulter has joined us and uh, Marcin Goss. So welcome to the, uh, the live stream, both of you. There are others there lurking in the background who haven't mentioned their names, but we do welcome some questions on here. It's supposed to be interactive. It's just not me uh, asking questions. It's your chance to ask Ian about the uh, Royal Navy submarine missions during the Cold War. And also, um, you know, Ian covers uh, modern uh, naval subjects as well so if you've got something maybe a little bit uh, less cold war we wouldn't mind one of those questions as well but ian i think what one of the 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 situations that i did find really interesting and the one that appeared to excite some of the uh, the listeners was around the war spite incident yeah, yeah. um so c can you just take take us through that again i never bore of this story yeah, I mean, it was uh, a key a key moment in the book. Uh, very um, dangerous, very exciting, and one of those, those episodes that to this day has not been officially confirmed. But basically, HMS Warspite was the third um, nuclear-powered submarine in the Royal Navy uh, built in the 1960s, and she was given what's called a special fit, which meant all sorts of um, pieces of equipment that would enable her to gather intelligence on the Northern Fleet, which is the main striking fleet of the Russian Navy today and was throughout the Cold War uh, up there in the Barents operating out of the Kola Inlet. Well, not the Kola Inlet, but the Kola Peninsula and the White Sea. So Warspite was sent up there on this secret mission to hopefully observe maybe weapons tests and hoover up any other intelligence they could find. And as they were in the Barents Sea, uh, they were uh, training um, an iceberg, as it's called uh, to this day, by the Ministry of Defence, but it was in fact an Echo 2 nuclear pad guided missile submarine. And what happened was the uh, the Russian submarine turned, uh, but, um, but rather looked like it was turning, having shut down one of its two screws. And so uh, Warspite went to turn under the submarine at the back and came into contact. And that pushed uh, the British submarine right over and also could have sent it to the bottom of the Barents Sea but uh, quick thinking in the uh, reactor room uh, enabled uh, Warspite to keep her reactor online, retain her power, and the boat was surfaced and the Echo 2 submarine surfaced as well. And these two um, opposing, ostensibly opposing submarines had a look at each other through periscopes. And then there was a tense moment where each one wondered what was going to happen. And the Echo 2 basically pushed off home and Warspite was left to inspect her damage, which was fairly substantial to the, the fin of, of the boat, the conning tower, the, 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 the pointy up bit, and so also to the bows as well. So after assessing the danger uh, of sinking and realising the submarine was watertight, they were able to take Warspite home and she got a, a brand new fin uh, eventually at Baron Furness. But it was one of those moments that could have ended uh, very badly, but through uh, you know the luck of God and and good grace, um, it was avoided. Yeah, very tricky. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I and I know your you know the Hunter Killers book is Royal Navy based, but presumably the the U.S. Navy had similar incidents as well. Are you aware of any of those? Uh, yeah, I mean, there were, in fact, the U.S. Navy's probably had more of them, but I mean, there have been other Royal Navy uh, close calls and um, incidents of contact, uh, but certainly the U.S. Navy has had had a number as well, and actually lost um, two submarines, um, Scorpion and also the Thresher. Uh, during the Cold War. One thresher that was accidental during trials. A scorpion is a mystery to this day. And uh, the Russians lost at least two as well. So it's, it's dangerous um, occupation, even in a time of so-called peace. So th- there were numerous episodes, I would say, but thankfully, none of them ever uh, resulted in, you know, exchange of weapons um, and turned the Cold War hot, which was a, a very good thing. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, we spoke about this in the episode about how dangerous it was serving in any of these navies uh, in submarines, because it was probably the only area of the Cold War where these boats were operating in really close proximity. You know, they they were toe to toe, you know, trailing each other if they could could find themselves. Yeah. And so it, it was probably the you know, one of the most dangerous er- or one of the areas where something could could have seriously gone wrong in the Cold War. Yeah, certainly. I mean, if you look at uh, the Central Front, then, of course, there are opposing armies looking across the, the Iron Curtain uh, in Germany in particular, etc. But there was separation there that meant that they weren't, you know, literally right up each other's bumpers. And uh, <laughs> at sea, at sea, uh, you had uh, submarines run at uh, war pitch because they had to be with warloads of torpedoes uh, in very close company, trying to keep tabs on each other, trying to follow each other, or trying to sneak up into for for the British and Americans into the Barents Sea to uh, to look at weapons trials and other things, and then down actually off the UK. Uh, one of the things that the Russians like to do was apart from sending submarines to sniff around the Clyde, uh, where the main uh, British submarine base was and is, to see if they could detect uh, Polaris submarines and also hunter-killer submarines going to sea and follow them. They also, the Russians were very, very persistent, and this is a part of the book actually, with their auxiliary uh, intelligence gatherers, these so-called trawlers, which they would send out to, to loiter around the exit points from uh, the Clyde of the Polaris submarines and also uh, off, uh, off Weymouth to see if they could put out fishing nets to interfere with, uh, with, with what's called the Thursday War, where, for example, uh, one submarine, uh, which was commanded by a guy called Doug Littlejohns, was um, there acting as a thing called the Clockwork Mouse, which was to run up and down for British anti-submarine frigates to train. And while this was going on off uh, off Portland, off Weymouth, uh, off the coast of Dorset, uh, these uh, Russian uh, trawlers, inverted commas, were putting nets out and actually snared the submarine. And uh, Doug had to take some pretty drastic action to get rid of the net. And uh, so they they were up to all sorts with their surface uh, auxiliary vessels as well. And that that, um, that is something that's sometimes overlooked, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I had an interesting chat with uh, Rob Forsyth uh, yeah. a couple of days yeah. ago, who was one of the uh, the COs featured in in your book about his uh, encounter with the Malin Head. Um, yeah, that's AGI. one. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very um, that was a very exciting incident for him, because he says that he had to uh, basically he was the XO of uh, Polaris submarine going out, and the CO was indisposed at that particular moment. I think he had a back injury, so Rob's in command. And this um, AGI uh, was basically coming really close and looked like it might actually, uh, if they weren't careful, collide with the submarine when she when she dived and uh, would at least hang on and try and ruin her ability to get away into the vastness of the ocean and, and do the deterrent patrol. So uh, Rob decided to order a, a crash dive to get away uh, quickly under the sea and um, he was, you know, they could hear the, this vessel passing over uh, just above. So they were lucky they got away with it. But I'm sure he told it 
much better than I did because he's a, he's got a fund of stories. That, uh, he certainly has yeah. got a fund of stories. Yeah. I was yeah. uh, on a call with him for two and a half hours, so yeah. uh, we're going to have two <laughs> two yeah. episodes there of uh, pack yeah. stories from, from Rob coming up. Now yeah. we have had a number of people join now, and uh, we have got some questions. If you've just joined, you can ask your questions in the chat box, which is to the right of your screen. Uh, we've got Dia and Mark. Uh, Vegas who who have joined and uh, Michele Florio has uh, joined as well and Mark has got a couple of questions he's asking was there a loss of life on Scorpion yes the entire crew basically everybody um, late 1960s um, she went out on a uh, deployment to the Mediterranean I think that was where they last saw her and then was due to arrive home uh, in the USA and was was never arrived. And eventually the wreckage was found on the floor of the Atlantic. And it's reckoned there was just some kind of malfunction with, with a weapon on board and uh, the boat was basically blown up. So yeah, I'm afraid that was a total loss of the boat and also the crew. And the same with the thresher as well. So, I mean, it's a dangerous occupation and when things go wrong, if, if everything uh, goes wrong, then that's, that's uh, usually fatal. Uh, the Russians, they lost, as I say, at least two submarines and they lost their crews as well. Yeah. OK. And uh, this is a, another question from Mark. What was the average length of time serv slash service on submarine deployments? Submarine deployments? Uh, well, with a nuclear submarine, obviously you can send the submarine out uh, technically to circle the world, circumnavigate the world um, and never surface. So you could take months, you could send a submarine out for months, but the crew might go insane. They'd eat all their food. And so they, the human element is the bit that means that you have to surface the boat or come home. And of course you've got to do repairs and maintenance. So, I, I mean, in Hunter Killers, the story of uh, War Spike deploying to the Far East is in there, uh, as told through the eyes of uh, a guy called Tim Hale who um, was aboard uh, as XO, and uh, she would be gone for months, and would, but called at Singapore, which is, you know, surface, called at Singapore, and also was involved in various exercises out there in what was then known as uh, the Far East, I suppose, Asia Pacific, as we would call it now. Um, and then on, um, if let's say you went up into uh, the north, the high north, it would be uh, several weeks. And sometimes when, when the British sent diesel boats up, into uh, the Barents Sea or around that area off northern Russia, um, they would send these basically rebuilt World War II era submarines, Super T boats as they were called, and they would basically dive for several weeks at a time, you know, up to 40 days and not see, or 40 days or more, and wouldn't see the outside world, and would be reliant on expelling fumes to charge their batteries because they weren't nuclear powered, and bringing in air for the people to breathe totally dependent on a snorkel, uh, which they poke above the surface of the sea to maintain their stealth. Because if they were seen as, and sometimes they were detected, they'd get depth charged, potentially attacked. So, you know, there was a lot of, um, a lot of effort put into keeping submarines hidden. So it could go from months with a port call or just several weeks uh, when you didn't have any kind of visit to a port. It's a simple way of saying it, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, well, th those diesel boats, I mean, I found it incredible, the stories of their missions under the polar ice, mm. um, you know, where obviously they had to find a gap in the ice in order to, to get air. Yeah, um, yeah. And whereas with a nuclear boat, you know, they, they didn't have so, so, so many worries. There must have been some close calls there, I would have thought. Yeah, yeah. I um, mean, uh, if you can imagine, you send um, an air-breathing submarine underneath uh, the polar ice um, and it's freezing cold. Uh, the batteries are probably going to dissipate quicker. You can't get up to uh, surface very easily to get air or to just basically let people out for a, a bit of fresh air and to make them feel like they're not in a cold tomb under the ice. So they had to look for these things called polinias, which is where the ice is thinner and slushy or just so they're able to break through and if they need to to uh, to to get air uh, expel fumes uh, charge the batteries using the diesels and let air in for the people but the british did 
take uh, diesel-electric submarines under the ice uh, far longer than the Americans and the Russians. So they, they, they exhibited a, a degree of risk-taking uh, with those boats that certainly the Russians and Americans had realised they had to give up uh, because they couldn't operate under the ice uh, without going nuclear. And, and the whole point of getting under the ice, particularly in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, uh, was to find, uh, from the British and American point of view, to find um, Russian nuclear missile submarines because they would hide under there waiting for the moment to fire their missiles. So it was a dead, quite a deadly game, but the British certainly pushed the envelope when it came to uh, diesel submarines under the ice. Yeah, yeah. Now, we have had some uh, further questions. Mike Chapman uh, is asking, are the stories of Royal Navy divers leaving slash entering substationed near Soviet ports via torpedo tubes true? That sounds uh, pretty incredible. As what well, actually getting into Russian submarines via the torpedo? Well, no, no, uh, leaving Royal Navy submarines ah, via the uh, torpedo tubes. I, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I in my books, I don't really go into that, but I would say that if you were to hazard a guess, um, not necessarily up in um, up in the Arctic, because I, I can't see that they get away with that up in the Arctic. Uh, but certainly, if you were to let's say speculate that in the Baltic. Uh, there might have been British uh, diesel submarines because too shallow for uh, nuclear powered submarines to actually operate safely when they're submerged may, who knows, have gone ashore to uh, scout around and uh, look at, uh, let's say, um, Soviet bases in the Baltic states. And that, that, that might have some uh, credence. I mean, it's not something that's ever been out there in, a, in an open way or... Um, um, widely talked about but certainly there are rumors and it's likely that um certainly when when british diesel submarines went into the baltic and there's not a lot on them either that they may well have um, landed people but i think they probably surface at night and put them out in a in a in a dinghy so i, I think firing people out or shooting them out of the torpedo tubes might be a bit a bit uh, more dangerous than it needed to be to get them ashore <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Rob mentioned to me about this technique of towing the SBS in right. via, via kayaks as as well. But I think you um, towing that, them that, in. You mean yeah, using submarines periscope. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's a different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, I mean, that's a World War Two uh, technique. So you know. Yeah. Yeah. But also, I think the Soviet Navy had some anchorages off North Africa. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess there's possibility yeah. that divers might have just I wanted to have know. a look at the underneath. To be of... honest, I mean, yeah. I mean, one of the things I do have in the book is um, uh, both Rob and Doug in his submarine, Doug Little Johns in his submarines, they, um, uh, they certainly uh, investigated uh, Soviet anchorages off um, Greece, uh, which is quite legal, it was in international waters, off uh, North Africa, and in Doug's case, actually in the Indian Ocean. And those feats that they undertook and of course you know they are representative of the Royal Navy's uh, submarine force diesel electric submarines um, and also when they served in nuclear submarines so this is you know the people in the book illustrate what the Royal Navy did uh, and other people did so lots of other people but certainly uh, they investigated submarines by basically uh, not submarines but uh, Soviet surface ships by basically going in under them dodging around their anchor cables Photographing the underside of the uh, of the um, of the vessel, and in one case, uh, Doug took his submarine into a harbour in the Indian Ocean and uh, had a look round uh, the vessels and claims um, that he, he disturbed a slumbering Soviet sailor on the upper deck of his vessel. He probably had too much vodka as this periscope went by, looking at him, and he probably thought he was hallucinating. So, but certainly, <laughs> those sort of feats are absolutely incredible to take a submarine into an anchorage and then dodge around without anybody seeing you and just basically gather intelligence uh, like that is just quite awesome really that's in, that's incredible yeah. incredible yeah. stories yeah. as as i found <laughs> talking yeah. to various submariners there's no shortage of no. of of incredible stories yeah. out there um if you've just joined if you want to ask a question use the live chat on the right hand side of the screen um we have a question from uh, Michele Florio. I hope I've pronounced your name properly. 
um, asking, and this is good, probably going to be a tough question for you, Ian, what was the best SSN during the Cold War? Ah, I know, McKayley. Um, what was the best SSN? Oh, my goodness. It depends, I suppose, what country you you talk to and also in what sense. Um, but, I mean, certainly the uh, Swishall class of the Raw Navy was very effective and the Los Angeles class of the US Navy and uh, the Akula, uh, certainly for the Russians. But if you're talking about general uh, submarines that were feasible and would work in a, uh, a, a an operational setting and a combat setting, then those three at the height of the Cold War were certainly worth uh, thinking about. Uh, possibly he's thinking about the Akula, the much vaunted Akula that is seen in the Hunt Fred October going 110% on the reactor that was uh, i think there were six of those and they were certainly remarkable not the akula the alpha get my submarines mixed up the alpha um the, certainly the alpha was a remarkable vessel very fast um incredible it could dive very very deep so good in terms of the technical aspects and as a, a piece of cutting edge technology but the problem was uh, the boat was noisy and as uh, doug uh, one of my submarine captains remarked if you went that deep and you went that fast, but you went that deep, and you you thought you could fire a torpedo. You you'd be insane because the moment you opened the the tube, then of course you know the pressure would destroy the boat. So you'd have to come up in an alpha to actually use the torpedo, and then you'd be detected. So in pure terms, the alpha was probably the most remarkable submarine. But in in terms of all round performance, you have to look at the um, Los Angeles class and the Swiss shores, and of course the Akulas, maybe the Victor Three. Uh, or Victor II of the uh, of the Soviet Navy. Uh, it's down to the people, though, um, as well. So it has to be down to the people who operate them, I think. Right. Maybe it's not, not the, you know, it's not what was the best one ever, but I think that's that's the best answer I can give on that one. That was quite a comprehensive answer, Ian. Yeah. And I'm surprised yeah. we got to 25 minutes in yeah. before mentioning, <laughs> mentioning Hunt for Red October, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, sorry about that. I had to get it in there. Well, no, you know, always my favourite. So yeah, uh, yeah. no problem there. We've got a question from Andrew, Andrew Tabiolo. Um, with hindsight and the information that's come out into the public domain, do you think NATO could have completed shipments of reinforcements from the United States to Canada in a 1980s World War Three? So resupply. The, yeah, across the Atlantic to, um, to Europe. Yes, I think yeah, that's what yeah. we're asking. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, they had uh, plans to to uh, obviously there was lots of prepositioning of equipment, and they had plans to get people across there as quickly as they could. But I mean, there was a thought that to actually escort all these uh, vessels that would have to come across effectively, you'd have to denude. Uh, the rest of the US Navy and pull it in, although the Royal Navy at that time was pretty substantial and you would have NATO allies involved. But um, I don't know. I mean, there certainly would have been a battle of the Atlantic in which uh, the Russians would have hurled, um, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of submarines out there. But the war wouldn't have lasted very long. So, uh, I mean, as you, you all know very well, Ian, I mean, there's just, I think the big question is, would, would anything have developed, you know, before it started and ended? So, I have to be honest, uh, although in the deadly trade to talk about the convoys and what they might do, I, I'm, I'm sceptical myself that actually the war would, la would have lasted that long. I think it would have ended quite quickly with either a nuclear exchange or people coming to their senses. And so maybe you wouldn't have even got the convoys together to get across there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it, it, good question, Andrew. Yeah. Um, Mark has another question. I think it, it's obviously come off your, your mention of sneaking into harbours, but it says, how is it possible to sneak in without detect detection and take in surveillance in a harbour? Well, they, they, the ones I was talking about of uh, North Africa, um, Greece, and also in the Indian Ocean, those, um, I'm pretty sure they were all in international waters technically. So that would mean that you could, you were quite, uh, um, okay to go into them, um, whether you're on the surface or whatever. But if you dive a submarine in uh, certain circumstances, there is an act of war, so it can be, be dangerous. But if you keep it on the surface, then obviously it can go wherever it likes. But they did do it. I mean, they took them in. They were very careful, very, very skillful, and uh, they, would, they would do their best uh, not to be seen. And I don't think they were seen. 
So it's just extraordinary that with a very, very, very narrow space between the bottom of the boat and uh, the seabed, they managed to do it. But they did. They did it. I mean, they. Uh, I do go into in the book something called the underwater look, which is done in open water. That's by nuclear powered submarines where they would uh, basically go underneath a Russian surface vessel and uh, photograph the underside looking for sonar domes and things. And that was a very, very tricky operation. Sometimes uh, the Russians did realise they were there, but that, that's a version of it out in the open ocean, uh, something that the SSNs used to do. Yeah, it must have been a really fine art with uh, getting that close, particularly in yeah. poor visibility. Yeah, I mean, just to explain, in, in the book, um, there's obviously the... the um, the cast, if you like, the, the guys that are telling us how they did things, they obviously go into technicalities of it, which I would never dare to try and replicate um, here off the top of my head. But there's certainly, um, if you read the book, then there's certainly uh, the, the guys in there do talk about uh, some of the technicalities of how they did it in terms of seafaring and being in command of a boat. They certainly do. So it's in there. What, what can I say? I, uh, I made sure when I was doing it, that it was um, properly done, uh, but I wouldn't dare try and explain it as a non-submariner and a, and a landlubber. And uh, if anybody's not bought the books, these are uh, the ones. In fact, Hunter Killers is under a, a different name in the US, which doesn't, I can't quite remember. Undersea Warriors. Undersea Warriors in the US and yeah. uh, Deadly Trade covers uh, submarines, yeah. I think, from Archimedes to the present day. It is does, it? Yeah, yeah. Hello, there you go. Yeah. I even remembered yeah. the tagline. <laughs> in America, the Deadly Trade is called the Deadly Deep, just to get the blatant advertising in there. OK, OK. <laughs> Uh, end of that commercial break. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Kressel has uh, joined the conversation and he's got a question for you. Um and uh, he says, you touch upon the vast difference between fact and fiction of Cold War subs depicted in pop culture. What, in your opinion, is the best depiction of them on page or screen in fiction? Wow. In fiction? Of Cold War submarines? Uh, yes. Yeah. Ah, tricky. Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't read that widely when it comes to Cold War submarine fiction i looked at loads of uh, obviously factual books obviously i've looked at and read the hunt for red october which i think is very highly rated by the submariners themselves um but uh, there's been some extraordinary uh, memoirs out there there was one by a guy called john coote about submarine uh, operations during the cold war and uh, so many that i looked at so i'm, I'm afraid i'm not going to be much um, much good on that one but I, I do you know I watched a lot of movies I read a few novels but I didn't I'll be honest with you I stuck to the factual stuff so uh, wherever I could find it what do you think of Clancy then um, I mean in terms of the uh, the knowledge the insider knowledge that he gleaned uh, when he was um, meeting many submarine captains I think in his job as a I think he was an insurance salesman I'll be correct. yeah bizarrely yeah, yeah. He, uh, he certainly showed that he had a, a good a good nose for an excellent story, and he got some amazing stuff out there. And um, I mean, in terms of you know, it's it's big big picture um, blockbuster fiction, um, and uh, certainly the the follow up or the the subsequent book, uh, Red Storm, is it Red Storm Rising? Is that what it's called? Yes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, certainly that one was, I would say, highly rated by people at the time who were in, in the Royal Navy, who read it. And uh, and in fact, some of them were actually depicted in fiction under fictional names in the book, including Doug Littlejohns, who was given a fictional name in it and was recognised by the first sea lord who called Doug into his office and said, uh, what are you doing in this book, uh, Doug? And uh, so Doug had to kind of say he knew nothing about it and he had no idea and, and all the rest of it. That's in, in, in the book. But certainly that book is, I think, um, highly rated by... Uh, by people and it's it's an action-packed book that does present many of the things that probably would have happened in a hot war so that's another one i'd, I'd say i would recommend right yeah. and and we're going back a bit here but what about das boot what, oh das boot yeah um yeah no and that's another one that's um i know from my uh submarine submariner friends is uh very um very respected very much liked i mean there's obviously things about it which they quibble with the amount of noise that the people make under attack, you know, and 
uh, light bulbs uh, breaking and exploding and, and was it nuts and bolts flying across, which I think they find just slightly too fanciful. But they certainly do think that's a, a good depiction of life in a, in a diesel boat. So, yeah, I mean, Das Boot is, um, is a brilliant movie um, and uh, probably up there with The Hunt for October is the two that I would select as the best. And then you've got Run Silent, Run Deep, as well, the old one with uh, Clark Gable and uh, Burt Lancaster, which was based on a novel by um, Ned Beach, who was a, uh, a Second World War uh, US Navy captain. So that's that's uh, quite an amazing uh, movie as well. If we're going into movies, that is. I don't know if you want to stray into them. Yeah, yeah. No, movies um, is, I, I think uh, Matthew's question was page or screen. So, oh, right. Sorry, uh, I didn't, I didn't yeah. uh, listen properly. No, it was probably my delivery there but uh yeah. yeah okay yeah i mean I, there certainly was one um which you can't really get uh, made by the bbc um about the and here i'm going to be found out because i sometimes get confused with the k numbers of russian submarines but about the, the it's, i've got it right in the book but in, about the russian submarine that went down in the uh the sargasso sea in the mid 80s um about the fight by the russian crew to save the uh the I think it was a Yankee class SSBN and eventually it was um, abandoned um, because the boat was beyond saving. That's a, that's quite, it was called Hostile Waters, but it's not available. But that's a pretty good uh, movie and that starred uh, Rutger Hauer as the captain of this uh, Russian submarine. Uh, so I'd recommend that, but unfortunately we can't get it. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll yeah. uh, have a hunt around for that. that. I hadn't heard of that one. So. Yeah. Well, you can't get it. I don't know what the reason is, but it, I think you can get it in Dutch or, or something like that, in Dutch language, but not in... Uh, it's very limited availability for some reason. I think a legal reason. Okay. Sure. Okay. We've got some other questions that have uh, come in. Um, Carlston Schulter has asked, how many of the deployed Russian SSBNs were monitored 24-7? Or what percentage of the boats on a mission were reckoned to have been monitored? That's uh, probably way above my pay grade. I'd have to be in the CIA or sort of deep in there. But I would, I would say that um, there were some legendary um, episodes in the Cold War where uh, American attack submarine captains managed to uh, trail Russian SSBNs for a long time, for days, you know, we edging up towards weeks. So I would say a percentage of them were. I mean, some of them. It might, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it might be that. Most of them were, you know, or just some of them. Uh, of course, the Royal Navy would claim that it's never had any of its uh, SSBNs uh, trailed at all since then. And um, I think the Americans have probably got a good record like that as well. So I'm afraid I have to say I don't know the percentage, but certainly that some of them were. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure anybody would be keen on revealing that either, no, even, no, even now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we have... Uh, quite another question from Michaeli. Um, can only one SSN keep a fleet in port today as it did in 1982 during the Falklands War? Yeah. I guess the answer is probably affirmative if yeah, the other Navy yeah. hasn't got anything yeah. comparable. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it depends who, you're, <laughs> depends who you're, you're up against, doesn't it? And whether or not you want to risk it. I mean, you wouldn't risk, um, you wouldn't risk that kind of thing with a, with a, a peer. Uh, but, you know, could they? Yeah, of course. You know, if there's a submarine out there, that uh, nobody knows where it is until you know where it is and you know that it's not going to attack you, then probably you're quite wise to exercise caution. Uh, though, of course, you know, if, if, depending on what the objective is, if you have to get something done, you'll have to go out there. So, I mean, it's it's a, a boat with a torpedo, uh, um, you know, a whole, a whole warload of torpedoes can sink quite a few ships. But, you know, it all depends how much you want to risk it. I mean, in the case of the Argentinians, I think it was just that the, the Royal Navy I think, had, I think, five SSNs available. I mean, they didn't know how many exactly. But, you know, once that happened, it was a case of, do you want to risk your aircraft carrier against a top-tier a Navy with nuclear-powered submarines? That's the key. And uh, so they decided not to um, after a certain point. So, I don't know, it depends who's fighting who or who wants to uh, tweak the nose of somebody else. Right, right. No, thanks for that. Um, question from Mark. Were submarine missions done under NATO rules and protocols or could countries go about ops independently 
of NATO. I'm presuming he's talking about NATO countries with their own submarine force as yeah. to whether they, they carried out their own independent missions according to their own national interests, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a classic example of that would, would be the Falklands War. I mean, they, we, we didn't do that as a NATO operation, uh, we being the UK, didn't do that as a NATO operation. We did it as a, a sovereign mission uh, to uh, basically uh, counter an invasion of what was British territory. So that was uh, outside of NATO. Um, and I suppose if somebody uh, needed to do that elsewhere, they would do that as well. Yeah, I'm sure they would. Well, I did an episode a while back, and uh, apologies uh, if I can't recall the episode number, but after doing 152, uh, it gets a bit difficult to remember <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. Um, but it was around the Dutch submarine operations because they were yeah. carrying out missions that weren't technically part of NATO, but were looking at Soviet subs. And again, it was these, um, the underwater looks and, th yeah. and things like that, yeah. uh, particularly in the Mediterranean, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you'll know more than me because obviously you did that as an episode. Now I know that we've, uh, on my magazine, we've reviewed, I think the book you're on about, but um, I'll be honest. I mean, what, what, why would they be looking at Soviet boats outside NATO requirements just for the Dutch I don't think it was just for the Dutch, right. but they were only reporting into a select few within NATO. Oh, right. OK. Um, so oh, I don't yeah. think it was generally known what right. they were up to. Well, that's that's a different thing. That's that's a kind of need to know thing whereby, you know, Northwood, uh, the naval HQ in North London would obviously operate um, submarines in various parts of um, the Mediterranean or the Atlantic and would basically have them um, in different tiers, if you like, of knowledge. So certain nations would know everything. Some nations wouldn't know if much, if at all, because it wouldn't concern them. And if, you're, if you're a nuclear submarine operator and uh, you, you've got to manage water space uh, throughout the whole of the NATO area, um, you do need to know, uh, the submarine operators need to know where the boats are and so there's no uh, friendly boats are, so there's no collisions. So they have a box of water which they operate in. So if you're, let's say, a nuclear submarine operator who's carrying out certain intelligence gathering missions, then you'll, you'll have a sort of level of knowledge between yourself, uh, let's say the British and the Americans. And I suppose as they were the, I think the only other NATO Navy that did the real top line um, surveillance like that. And of course the Dutch would be privy to what's going on within a sort of task force uh, operated from Northwood, uh, which which has all the information it needs to know about where the various uh, submarines that are assigned to that mission are. So, but would you tell the <laughs> would you tell the French or would you tell the Spanish? And not because you don't like them or that you don't that you don't um, <laughs> want them to know just because of who they are, but because why would they need to know? Um, I think maybe this is part of the question. Why would they need to know what the Dutch are up to in terms of um, surveying? Um, the Russians in the Med, but of course the British and the Americans might know that because they're in the same business. I mean, that's a, a roundabout way of saying, I suppose it is true that certain people knew things and certain other people didn't. Yeah. 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 No, the, the French is an interesting uh, conversation and it's not really yeah. something we, we covered in, yeah. a, in our episode because obviously yeah. they have their own independent nuclear yeah. um, deterrent. Um, they're not technically part of part of nato and i think i did ask the question on twitter as to whether the french do have an equivalent of the letter of last resort mm. and didn't really I mean, get a conclusive answer i mean um i might be showing my latter day ignorance here but france now is a fuller member of nato than it was during the cold war certainly so mm. i would say and i can't remember if i certainly remember having the conversation with uh, one of the guys in the book um, but i I would certainly say that when it came to certain nuclear submarine operations, that because the French were semi-detached, if uh, you know, not really in 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 the alliance uh, like they maybe used to be, um, then they were um, not in the loop. So, but that was because they didn't they themselves weren't didn't want to be fully embedded in it and wanted a, a, a measure of independence from. Uh, from NATO to do their own thing. So I would say that, that you know, it's it's one of those conundrums. You know, should we tell the French? <laughs>
yeah. yeah, we're yeah. Let's not go too close no, to not, contemporary yeah. political yeah. conversations either. Um, Andrew has a question. Um, what was the nature of any cooperation between NATO and Sweden during the Cold War, if any? Yeah, I mean that's that's an interesting one. That is um, officially, obviously, there wasn't um, cooperation. I mean, it comes back to the Baltic and the whole question. Uh, because it's a big story. It is a big story in the Baltic of uh, NATO submarines um, sneaking around in the Southern Baltic and in the Baltic in general, uh, trying to um, find out things and also Russian submarines. So I suppose the question is, did the Swedish uh, military officially help NATO? No, it didn't. But was there some level of, um, I don't know, unofficial um corporation i don't know i'm not an expert in it but there might well have been that's all i can say on that really yeah well i've i've been given a couple of contacts to do an interview uh about the swedish um i was going to say contribution to the cold war but swedish operations in in the cold war because i'm particularly fascinated by the whiskey on the rocks yeah 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 um where that soviet submarine ran aground near karlskrona yeah. Um, so uh, I will dig deeper in that, and that could be an interesting uh, episode for any of you submarine fans out there, and I can tell there's a few. Um, we have a couple of other questions from Dia. Um, did China have any submarines involved in the Cold War? Yes. I mean, China had, um, I think, it's, I mean, I'm testing my brain cells here, at least one uh, ballistic missile submarine, and I'm not sure, and, you know, it's obviously I want to write the book, so I'm fully versed in it. Um, and I'm trying to recall what I found out there. But, I mean, in, in essence, China um, had at least one ballistic missile submarine. It's uncertain if it ever did a nuclear deterrent patrol. And they certainly developed and evolved uh, nuclear-powered attack submarines, probably towards the latter end of the whole thing but not extremely active not very active and very noisy and compared to russian and um, french and british nuclear pad and american uh, nuclear pad submarines um, very easy to detect and probably to destroy but they were not involved in the cold war i mean apart from korea obviously uh, but they certainly weren't involved in the cold war at sea um, to any great extent although there was there was uh, I feel interest in just keeping an eye on them every now and again. Right. So there wasn't continual operations no, like with well, the I Soviet mean, Navy. No, I mean, it, it just they, didn't have the bandwidth probably to cover yeah. that as well no. as the. Well, I mean, they, they probably, I mean, they just weren't, you know, they weren't in the same league at all. Mm. Um, I mean, today is a different matter, but they certainly weren't in the same league at all as the Russians out in the Pacific with the Americans in terms of nuclear powered boats. And then, of course, they would, they, their Navy was very, uh, in those days, it was much more of a coastal orientated force anyway. So, hence, it wasn't in the game. Okay, thank you. Um, another question What is or was the largest nuclear sub? Oh, well, uh, during the Cold War, obviously, it was reputed to be the, uh, the Typhoon, the Russian uh, ballistic missile submarine, uh, made famous by, by the Fred October. Um, I mean, the, the higher class, the American um, ballistic missile submarine that came in, I think, in 1980, was pretty big. But the, the, in terms of, you know, of, of how the beam and the size and the sheer ginagrousness of it all, then it would have to be the Typhoon, um, of which I think there's still one left uh, in operation, which they bring in. They have certainly recently brought into the Baltic um, to show off at the Navy days in St. Petersburg, in recent years, but it's so big that I don't think they've, they've been able to dive um, the submarine in the Baltic just to show off their last remaining typhoon on the surface. But so, yeah, yeah, I put that at the top. Yeah, it's worth finding photos of the typhoon. It is yeah. an absolute monster. Yeah. And I think it had a swimming pool or at least yeah. a plunge Corner, pool. Swimming pool, yeah. All that sort of stuff, yeah. Yeah, I've heard that. There was, there was a remarkable set of photographs actually on the internet at one stage of the inside of one of these, showing you all that stuff. So it's true, yeah, they did have those sort of facilities. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, and uh, another question from Carsten. Um, are the crews able to identify other NATO subs, e.g. a UK sub able to detect a US sub in the Baltic or elsewhere? 
in the Baltic, what today in the part, yeah, in the, cold... in the I think in the cut. Let, let's take it as being the Cold War. Yeah, I'm, yeah, okay. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I you know, I, I can't give a definitive, definitive answer on the Baltic, but I don't. I mean, the submarine operators for NATO in the Baltic would have been uh, the Danes, the Germans, um, and the British would have been in there every now and again. Um, and so, if there was a Russian a diesel submarine um, poking around there, then they would have tried to detect it and they would have known each other's sound signatures as well. But it's out in the the main arena, you know, the Atlantic, that, you know, of course, American submarines could identify British ones and, and um, Russian ones as well and would know the difference. But, of course, the other thing is that if it's a NATO submarine operating under water space management inside its own area, then uh, depending on your level of knowledge, then they, they will be kept away from each other and shouldn't intrude into their particular uh, part of the sea. And that would mean that any submarine that comes in will be a Soviet submarine um, at the time. So they can, but the, the aim is to not deconflict them so they never have to kind of listen to each other or go too close to each other, um, which is, I suppose, a, a bit of an elaboration on the answer. But, um, yeah, that's how it worked, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. A while yeah. back, again, I can't remember the episode number, but I interviewed a Canadian anti-submarine warfare uh, pilot. I think he was on Neptunes, and it, yeah. and he was saying that they could detect Polaris, for example, yeah. Yeah. because they knew its 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 signature and probably I don't know, presumably had better kit than perhaps the Soviets. Yeah. And of course, we mustn't forget the Canadians also had a submarine arm as well. We mustn't forget that, and that they were involved with their um, what, their version of the Oberon class. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, everybody would have um, a library of what um, submarines sound like and would be able to suss out which one was one of ours and which one was one of theirs. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got another couple of questions. They're coming in quite thick and fast. Yeah. Here, Ian, um, yeah. with this is from Andrew with computer advances coming fast and furious in the 80s and the advent of commercial digital signal processing. How fast were these technologies being upgraded on NATO submarines? Um, I have no idea, I'm afraid. I mean, I'm going to be honest, you know, <laughs> I don't know. No. About one, you know, well, you've done really well so far. So uh, <laughs> I don't, mean, don't, don't worry about that. Swift, that's about all I could say, you know, I don't really know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would imagine they are almost ahead of the curve with some of the technologies out there and are trying to deliver this stuff. In the Cold War? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, a massive infrastructure, massive amount of effort put in by both sides to try and it out with the others, of course, yeah. But yeah. I don't, I'm afraid I don't know the technical side of that at all. That's no, that's fine. That's fine. It's a, this one I quite like from uh, Matthew Cressel is, uh -huh. was, was there a Royal Navy equivalent of IV bells, i.e. tapping the undersea Soviet Navy phone lines? Uh, yeah, uh, reputedly, I think. Um, <laughs> No, hang on. I mean, it's not I, It's not something I went into particularly in uh, Hunter Killers because it didn't involve the people, because I had f four submarine captains who hand on the baton, plus other people, you know, uh, ratings and other people that served in the boats they were in. But I think, and I could be wrong, I could be entirely wrong, but I think, was it Conqueror uh, was involved in something to do with that? I'm not sure. Um, there was talk of a story, but I'm I'm pretty sure that the Royal Navy would have been involved in that, but I don't know. Um, it didn't. It didn't enter into my story, so I didn't. Uh, I didn't do it. Yeah. yeah. Do, <laughs> do you uh, do you plan to return to you know do further stories along the lines of Hunter Killers? Um, yeah. I mean, I I would um, I would like to. I mean, I would like to do uh, at some stage another um, submarine book, and I think as time goes on, I probably will. But I, I, I mean, there's, a, there's something circling in my my head at the moment. But I mean, I, I, I do live in a part of the world where there's lots of submariners uh, from the Cold War era, and I know a few of them. And I'm, it's just trying to find what what you have to try and find for a book that people will be interested in, and then it can, that's accessible and that's exciting. Is you have to find compelling characters, a good story that's got a, a simple idea, and then uh, that's the thing. 
it's a vast subject and there's so much out there that hasn't been told but how do you do it as well while appealing to people so that's the that's the thing i'm thinking about is what's uh, what's next and how do i make that work for um for a broad audience because you want to appeal to professionals and people that know a bit about naval history and naval developments but you've also got to think well it'd be nice to draw other people into it so they learn you know and how do you do that that's that's the yeah. thing i'm at at the moment so i think one day i will but i'm not quite sure what it'll be yet yeah. that's the same challenge i have with every episode of cold yeah. War conversations yeah, Ian, yeah. to be honest that's incredible <laughs> I mean, I'm, I can't. I'm, and the, the the variety that you've come up with, and the people that you found is is incredible. So well done to you on that one. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. But there are no shortage of stories yeah. out there, yeah. and exactly. uh, that yeah. the, they are just yeah. well, as as you can tell from my my voice, yeah. I am just fascinated by the subject. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a few other questions because we've got five minutes left. Uh, Time flies. So uh, anybody who wants to get a question in, better hurry up now. Um, it's a bit of a follow-up. This is Michele again. Where's the best place to go for information on the role of French SSN during the Cold War? I don't know. I'm afraid I'm going to blank on that one. Um, I could always email the Marine Nationale and see what they say. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I'm afraid. Sorry about that, Michele. Um. A question from from me. Um, when we did the episode, we talked about the early Cold War and the Nazi technology that was uh, inherited by both the British, the Soviet, and I think various other navies as well. Were there any like Werner von Braun characters who were taken alongside that technology and who were working in the UK or the US? Yeah, I would say there were. Um, I mean, I would digress into the deadly trade on that one. I'd probably have to look up his name in the book, but certainly in the book there, um, uh, I could do that, but we don't have any time. So I'll just keep it short. There was a scientist working in the uh, the German missile programme whose brother was a U-boat captain, and he was developing all sorts of things, which basically were to try – one of them was to try and fire – uh, ballistic missiles from a, basically a towed compartment and he also did other missile tests and his brother uh, was one of the people that uh, fired uh, these weapons in tests and trials now he went to america after the war and lo and behold uh, a ballistic missile compartment was put into by the end of the 50s was put into mid 50s to late 50s put into a submarine so yeah that guy he's in the book and if we had time i'd look up his name but certainly it's worth it was worth putting in the book and I have got a bit in there on him. Okay. Another good reason to uh, read yeah. the deadly, the deadly trade there. Yeah. Um, quick question from Carson. Well, it's probably not a quick question, but do you think that the Greenland Iceland UK gap was monitored just with SOSUS or because of the classified SOSUS data with subs in the conventional way? So, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what that what that question is. Well, I think it's, was there some other tech being used to monitor the Greenland, Iceland, UK, or was it purely SOSUS? I don't know. I mean, SOSUS was immensely powerful and could hear virtually anything. Um, so uh, in addition to that, you'd have picket lines of um, British diesel electric submarines, maybe up there, but I'm afraid I don't know. But SOSUS... Um, you know, seabed detection is immensely powerful and immensely capable, so they might not have needed anything else. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know. No, that's that that's fair enough. I think I have exhausted the uh, questions there. So your interrogation for tonight looks like it's over, yeah. Ian. Yeah, I hope it wasn't too bad. I hope I survived being in the hot seat. You know. Well, no, it, it's really interesting <laughs> because we covered we covered stuff that you know we hadn't covered in the in yeah. the, in the other interview. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, and, you know, I do recommend these two books uh, if you can get hold of them. Yeah, um, they're easily to get hold of. They're on Amazon. They're on any, you know, any anywhere you can purchase slightly different names for the US versus the uh, yeah. UK. Same, same text. But yeah. Yeah. But yeah. just search for Ian Ballantyne uh, and uh, you'll you'll be able to find them. There are a rattling good read and uh, do have a listen back to episode 150, where we do go into quite some detail on uh, the Hunter Killer stories. So uh, we've got a few thank yous coming out. Oh, hang on. Quick one. 
Yeah. Last one. How are nuclear subs decommissioned? Decommissioned? Yeah. Uh, well, they're brought in and they, they, all the, uh, well, the reactor won't be there. The reactor will have been taken out. The reactor material would have been taken out and then they're sort of stored um, with very low level uh, radioactive material in them. Um, and that, you know, a lot of that's removed as well. And they, in terms of British ones, they're, they're still with us. Uh, in Devonport in Plymouth and also um, up in uh, Rosyth in Scotland. And they, they, the, the plan for a long, long time has been to cut them up. But the, the problem is what to do when you cut them up and how to get rid of it. But obviously the Americans, I think, have buried quite a few. Um, oh, and really? the, the massive interior and the Russians have basically scrapped and got rid of them. So Britain, Britain's still waiting. They're, they're still there. The Cold War submarines are still there waiting to be disposed of yeah one actually a question that, that that springs to mind off the back of that is there any ssbn that is a museum ship yes i would and i can't tell you the name but it's a french one and i believe it's a breast uh, that's an ssbn i believe um but check that one out there's also nautilus um in america she's um she's on view and maybe and currently you can visit HMS Courageous here in the UK, but the 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 access has been restricted. But there's plans for a new Cold War museum in Plymouth where Courageous will be the centerpiece. So there's you know there's SSNs, two at least two SSNs, one British, one American, I think a French SSBN, but maybe people know of others as well. Right, right. Well, well, electric boats, including HMS Alliance at Portsmouth. Sorry, Gosport. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, Ian, thank you very much for coming on our, our live stream. This will be available as a uh, recorded interview as well on our YouTube channel uh, if you missed the start of this. But, uh, Ian, thank you very much. And uh, if you're doing anything else, Cold War, yeah, you know, give me the call because yeah, uh, we, we'd love to have another chat. OK, brilliant. Thanks for having me. And um, thanks for all the questions. And I hope I provided some half decent answers. Very good answers from what I can see from the uh, yeah. comments. So thanks very much, Ian. Take care. See ya. Bye. Right, you still there?